Good morning, everyone. How are y'all doing today? Morning. Good morning. All right. For our first song, if everyone would please turn to page number 108 and stand. We are going to sing, sing to the Lord with a cheerful voice. Be careful. Page number 108. Oh, Great opening. If everyone now turn over to page number 82, we are going to sing To Thee I Lift My Soul, after which we'll get Mr. Randy Sherrick to come do our opening prayer and his first sermon for the day. Thank you. And now for opening prayer and uh, short sermon, Mr. Randy Sherrick. Great Eternal Father, we your children come together today on this, the Sabbath day, to ask you in the name of our Savior and soon coming King Jesus to descend your spirit upon all of us, the listeners, the speakers, so that we may be enlightened to your truth that we may apply your truth, your word, and the understanding that you are giving us 
that we may become better children and better lights for you. Father, thank you for all you have given us. You all may take your seats. The title of this is Unintentional Blindness. What is that? It is where... Have you ever gone with a group of people to a museum or wherever, and after it was all over with, you're just sitting, you're talking, having a good time, and they say, do you remember seeing whatever it is? And you said, I never ever saw that. They said, how? How didn't you see it? You were right there with me. Your focus was on something else to where you didn't see what they saw. Because of your focus, you did not see everything around you because of how we focus. There was a experiment. It's an experiment that most everyone knows or a lot of people know. It's called the invisible gorilla. It's where, <coughs> it's where there was two sets of kids, three people or in each set. They each, each set had a basketball. One was wearing white shirts and the other set of three was wearing some other color shirt. And what your object was, this was done on, well, through a TV camera to where you're watching it on TV. And the object is, follow the ball that the kids in the white shirt, how many times do they pass it to each other? They're dribbling the basketball and they're doing stuff with it. And so for about a minute, you are watching this video or whatever. And you're counting every time the basketball was passed to another person in a white shirt. And at the end of the video, they said, okay, how many times did the ball get passed? And you were supposed to count it silently to yourself. And you silently said, okay, X amount of time. And at the end of it, it said that they passed it X amount of time. But then they bring up another question. And this question was, did you see the gorilla? After a few seconds of watching their film, because they backed up the film so you couldn't actually see it, there was an individual in a gorilla suit that walked into the middle of the group, faced the camera, thumped his chest a couple times, then turned and exited. In this experiment, over half the people did not see the gorilla. Okay, that's one thing. Now, whenever anyone watched it, because they redid it later, years later, they did the exact same thing. And these people knew that the gorilla was coming, so they watched the gorilla, except the kicker was, at the end of it, did you see two other anomalies that was done, and the majority of those people did not see two of the things that happened because they were unintentionally blinded because of the focus they had. In the beginning, it was to focus on the basketball. The second time, it was to focus on the gorilla to where they didn't see what else was happening. And that's what we're going to use for today. Do we have unintentional blindness or do we have also intentional blindness? Do you intentionally blind yourself? And the question or the answer to that should be yes. Here's how. We're going to use that example with the basketball and the gorilla. The basketball is the way you are supposed to live your life according to God. The gorilla is sin walking through. Now, when you're watching the basketball, you are focused on on the way God wants us to live our lives, do we miss the gorilla? Do we miss the sin? Do we miss Satan trying to distract us from following God? We are so focused, we intentionally blind ourselves so that when Satan tries to penetrate our armor so that we will sin, we don't because we don't see it, therefore we don't dwell on it or have to deal with it. 
Jesus Christ, when he was being tempted by Satan, what did he do? He used scriptures to answer Satan. But prior to that, he was 40 days fasting and praying to God. So how can we intentionally focus on God and not be distracted by a gorilla? Two ways. That, there's more than two, but I just picked two ways. The first one is three little words. It's in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? It means you are always in communication with the Father. You are never out of communication with the Father. And if you are always talking to the Father, where's your focus? Yeah, it's on the Father. And the second one is Psalms 1-2. This is a man after God's own heart. King David, what did he say? He said, he said but his delight is in the law of the eternal. And in his law, he meditates day and night. What does that mean? It means if you're not in communication with God, then you are dwelling upon the laws, the statutes, the commandments, the examples God gave us to how to live our life. We are meditating, thinking about we're either praying and talking to God or we're meditating and thinking about God's laws. If that is all you are doing, yeah, you go through your daily life, but in your daily life, you can still think and talk to God. When you're in a vehicle driving, do you turn on the radio and then you start to get into the beat, get into the music, or do you keep the radio off to where it's total silence and now you're talking to God? It's just you saying, God, here's what's happening today in my life. Here's what, whatever. You're just talking to God. Where's your focus at that point? It's on God, the Father. Now, that's intentional. That is where you are trying to totally blind yourself from outside forces to where it's only God you are focused on. Now the other one, we're going to still use the ball and the, the, um, the gorilla. Thank you. <laughs> this one, this one is the ball is the way of the world. It's all the lust, the, the desires, the envies, the strifes, everything. It's the, it's the way of the world. Are you looking at, what does my neighbor have? He has a better car than I do. I have to get a better car. My neighbor or my friends have better clothes. I need to get, to get dressed better to look like them. Are you concerned about the ways of this world? That's what you're focused on, the ball is. What's the gorilla? Now, don't take this out of context. It's only an example. The gorilla is a blessing that God is giving you that is walking through. Is your focus so focused on them? The anger you have against somebody to where all you're dwelling about is, I can't wait till they get theirs. Take a politician. I don't care what side of the political field you're on. Go to the other side and think of that one politician you can't stand. How much does that politician affect you? Or at work, you have a co-worker you just can't stand. How much time occupies your, your thoughts because of that individual? Because all it is, it's someone of the world. And now God, them, he's talking to the Pharisees. It's in Matthew. That's where we're going to leave it. <laughs> and if you can ever find verses 42 and 43, you will find it. But this is in Matthew. Now, I do know it's in Matthew. It said, Jesus said to them, talking to the Pharisees, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone which the builder, builders reject has become the chief cornerstone. This was the eternal's doing, and it is a, and it is a marvel in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, talking to the Pharisees, the leaders of Israel, I, therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you 
and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. The exact same thing that happened to their ancestors. Their ancestors did not enter the promised land. They died in the wilderness. And the Pharisees did the exact same thing to the nation of Israel. Chapter 21. Awesome. Innocent computers. Great. <laughs> That's Matthew 21, 41. Okay. What this thing is, is where were the Pharisees' eyes focused? Man's law. Why are your disciples not washing their hands before they eat? Who cares? But they cared. It's where their focus was. The gorilla walked by. Jesus himself, their creator, the creator of all of this, was talking to them and they never saw it because of where their focus was. Where is our focus today? Are we focusing on the ball that represents the Father? Are we focused totally on the Father? Dwelling on His words. Praying to Him. All we see is the first resurrection. Or is our focus on somebody has something better than I do. I don't have what I want. I am worried about how the world will feel about me, think about me, say about me. Is my focus on the world? And all the blessings are going by and we are never getting them because we don't see them. And what happens if you focus on the latter? When you focus on the world, same thing that happened to the Pharisees. Same thing that happened to the Israelites in the wilderness. They did not make it into the promised land. They did not make it into the first resurrection. Where is your focus? Is it on this world that's going to be destroyed? Or is it on the first resurrection? On the Father? On being a bride of Jesus? Where is is your focus. Or how are you. Being intentionally blinded. Staying on the focus of the father. Or are you unintentionally blinded. Focused on the world. What is your focus. Thank you Randy. Randy. All right, for our third song, if everyone would uh, turn to page number 75 and stand up, we will sing, My Eyes Upon, uh, upon the Lord Continue Your Set. Page number 75.
Thank you. Please be seated. And now for the main message and the announcements, uh, blah, 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 and announcements you might have, <laughs> Mr. Ron Harmon. <laughs> Well, I'm not the gorilla. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. We got that clear now, the way. All right. Just a couple of announcements before we get started here. Daylight savings time tonight, folks. It's spring forward. So you lose an hour of sleep in the morning. But the good side of that is, is, is it doesn't get, it won't get dark till about 7:30 now. So, right off the bat, very good. And uh, don't forget, we got Passover coming up. That is April 18th here. It says 19th on your little card, but if you look at the little asterisk, it says the evening before. So, be the 18th here. And we'll probably start at 8 o'clock. And then uh, first day of unleavened bread is the 20th. Last day is the 26th. They'll both be at Salado at the Holiday Inn Express. All Everybody out there in Internet land and here are invited. It will be a covered dish. You are welcome to join us. And it will begin at 11 a.m. services. So and just let everybody know. And make sure you got your homes cleaned out. Start deleavening now so you don't have a problem. You know, the last day you're trying to chunk all your bread out. <laughs> Feed it to the birds. All right. Well, it's that time of year when we begin talking about those things. And we also begin putting our gardens together and getting those in shape. I've spent the last two days breaking my back doing that very thing. And I have quite a bit of a backache today, so I know I must have did it well. <laughs> uh, but putting a garden together and cleaning it up, it reminds me of a parable Christ told to the people of his day and to the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so, I, and it's the parable of the sower, and that's what I want to talk about today. And, and I want to just begin by reading the, whole, reading the first part of that parable. And we'll start in Mark chapter 4, verse 1. <clears throat> and a, uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 1. And again he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat, on, and sat it in, in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was, was on the land facing the sea. Now, you know why they did that, don't you? You understand? Because your voice carries across the water. It's like a megaphone when you're speaking from a boat off to the land. I, I've, I've seen that where you've heard people speaking like across a river or something. Their voice would just carry across that water. It's amazing. But anyway, we'll go on. Verse 2, and it says, Then he taught him many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some of the seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of the earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no roots, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seeds fell on the ground, and the ground yielded a crop that sprang up and increased and produced thirty, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. Then he said to them, He who has an ear... Ears, let him hear. I guess you got to have two. Anyway, let him hear. <laughs> anyway, so that's the first part of the story, and we're, we'll go through the rest of it here in just a little bit. But the par parable of the sower appears in, in three, uh, three of the Gospels. That's Mark 4, which we just read, Matthew 13, and Luke 8. And for all intents and purposes today, we'll probably be using exclusively Mark 4. For our main reference, I may have quoted something out of one of the other Gospels is the reason why I said probably. Well, the first two verses in Mark set the scene, of course, the verses 3 through 9 tell the story as we just read. And what it, it tells us, and I think we can all understand it, it concerns a sower who scatters seeds which falls on four different types of ground. And when someone reads this or hears this parable, you really need to understand why Jesus was telling 
or, or, or telling this story in the way that he did. And in the way that we probably ought to look at it, just as as the way he was trying to get the Jewish people of that time to look at it, because they were agrarian society at that time, and they all knew about planting gardens and everything else because it was their livelihood. You don't plant a garden back in, you don't do much eating. All right. Excuse the double negative there. You need to visualize that and what he's saying whenever he tells a story. And because, like I said, they were used to turning the soil. They were used to doing the things that causes plants to grow and seeds to sprout and those kind of things. And they understood that explicitly. So Jesus explains it using what they know about planting and to explain the condition of a man's heart is what he's talking about. He's not talking about planting an actual seed, although he uses that to paint the picture in the people's minds. He tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, he says, And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit, and I will put it within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So he, used, he, he uses one metaphor from one, one condition, or, or like planting, and then he turns around and looks at the heart, and he uses the same metaphor back uh, back with it. In other words, he uses it to describe the heart as stone. He also says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 9 through 10, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick, so who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart, test the mind, to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. So there again, we're looking at, at, at a description where the heart will produce fruit if, if he obeys God. And one more to make my point. Mark chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. For from within, out of the heart of man, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, or se sensuality, yeah, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within, and they defile a person. This is what, it comes from the heart. In the scripture, the heart is the seat of the indwelling of sin, as well as it being subject to deceit. It's from the heart that sp sin springs forth and grows. And we, we build or we allow that desire to swell up in us. And it's also from the heart as to where we determine whether we're going to accept God's word or not. In Ecclesiastes nine chapter th or nine chapter nine verse three, it says, "This is an evil that all is done under the sun; that one thing happens to all. Truly, the hearts of, of the sons of men are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live, and after that they go to the dead." So it describes the heart as being in some kind of madness state. And to us who truly seek God's word, sometimes it does seem like madness when we look at it in another person because to us, God's word's so evident. And, and we can't, sometimes we don't understand why people can't or won't see God's truth. I, I don't know how many conversations we've had over the years where we go, I just don't understand why they can't see it. I don't understand why they can't see the Sabbath. I don't understand why they can't see God's holy days. I, I just don't understand. And I know we always fall back on that same old uh, line. Well, God hasn't, hasn't given them the eyes to see or the ears to hear or things like that. He's blinded them. And, and true, He has. But it's, it's also from within their heart. And maybe it goes to what Randy was talking about in his sermonette about them being so focused on trying to please God through their ideal of what God is that they can't really see the truth. It says in Hebrew... You thought I wasn't listening, did you? <laughs> it says in Hebrews, God's Word can, can pierce the heart of man. His word is delivered to the world and has, has, has that effect. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
He says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. God's word can do that. It has the ability to do that if the people want it. Let me put that caveat in there. If you truly want to know what God is trying to do in this world with man, God's words can penetrate your heart. If you don't, it's going to bounce off like a ricochet. Well, let's look a little deeper and for more understanding of this parable. The sower, now while that can be debatable as to who or what that is, in my humble opinion, because it doesn't really say in this, this particular parable who the sower is, but in my humble opinion, the ultimate sower is, is the Messiah. Or at its least, the representatives, his representatives here on earth are the sowers also. In the farming community back then, there was multiple people who worked the field, multiple people who plowed, multiple people who, who it depended on the side of, size of the field for one thing, but on the larger fields, and in, in, in like commercial fields, we would look at these days where you see the giant tractors and everything else. You might have several oxen out there, or teams of oxen and stuff, plowing these huge fields. Well, after the fields were plowed, you would see men lined up abreast with their bags of seeds walking down a field throwing throwing their seeds, spreading the seed. That was a sower. There would be many of them in a field. And God, I guess one could look at God's whole church as a group of sowers for God's Word. The seed, without a doubt, is God's holy words because it tells us that. In Mark parable, it says the, the one, the one who is a sower, goes out to sow It doesn't really say what he is sowing, but what he is painting the picture in their minds is, is he's out there sowing the seed, he's out there spreading the word, and the, and, and the word and the stem of the Greek verb spirion, asperia, meaning sowing, to sow, uses the same stem as the Greek noun sperma, meaning seed. So by implication, one assumes that the parable is talking about sowing seed. And the interpretation is reinforced when he later says that birds came and ate some of the seed. And others were scorched by the sun or, or choked by thorns or bushes, but he, he never actually says the word seed in that parable. And Jesus later, later explains that the sower is not sowing seed, he's sowing the word. We had not got that far yet in, in the parable, but the, he tells us that's what he's doing. Now this is a key. This is the key to solving the riddle, because each verse contains key words. These key words are used to point or to refer to words that should be understood by the context of the story. Even though it's not even stated as, as seed. Now, I don't want to get too deep into the minutiae and we get all distracted, but the parable is talking about the ground, the parable of the sower. And he gives us four conditions of, of the ground. And as I said earlier, the ground is the heart of man. The hard ground, the hearted heart of a man. The seed goes by the way. It doesn't take root. It prevents the seed from sprouting at all, and the seed becomes nothing more than just bird food on the ground. And he says this, he gives the explanation in verse 14 of this particular situation. He, he says, the sower, the sower sows the word, and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. And when they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their heart. So they hear it, but they don't even pay any attention to it. How many of you have ever talked to somebody and they just their eyes just kind of glass over after about the first two sentences and and you know well it, it doesn't you're not doing any good here at all and that's kind of kind of this way it's a hard heart one might say but you know something I got to thinking about this 
And I re and many times when Virginia and I are up in Colorado and stuff, and we're walking around, even down here in Texas, I've seen solid stone out there on the ground, huge stone and stuff, and, and that stone will collect dirt in, in crevices and things, and you'll see grass growing up in them sometimes. And I thought about that when I thought about this, and, and what it said to me was, even a small amount of seed can sprout on hard ground. They can, they can see a little bit of the truth, because after, after all, many of these people are, are perfectly good, you know, considered good Christians, they go to church and all this, or Catholics, or whatever you want to say, and they see God's truth. I don't care what, that they, they may not understand what they're seeing, they see it, they hear it, they may not understand it, but it's there. And maybe just a little bit of it does take sprout on occasions, but it, get, it quickly goes away. It quickly, you know, it might as well be bird food because it just, it, it doesn't do any good. And I, you know, it's, it's just enough to allow a little bit of seed to sprout just a little bit but then it immediately dies away because they go, oh, well, you know, doesn't matter. God's word can be, can be heard and certain things can take hold in, the, in a hard heart. The stony heart in regards to God's word, we can see in the Bible People can trust His Word, think that they trust His Word, but reject them at the same time. They, they see His... How many people, how many homes in this nation have Bibles, yet they reject what's in them? That's a stony heart. Proverbs, it says in Proverbs 3, verses 1 through 2, He says, My son, do not forget my teachings, but let your heart keep my commandments. For the lengths of days and years of life and peace they add up to you. So we can learn many things. There's many people who've learned many things, yet they never took it to heart. There's people who, who I'll give you a couple of them, uh, examples, like Adams Clark Commentary. One of the best commentaries out there you can get in, in regards to tell, teaching you what's, what the Scriptures say and what they mean. Yet at the end of it, and he'll even tell you how the Sabbath is holy and the seventh day and all this and everything else. And at the end of it, he'll tell you, yeah, but you ought to go to church on Sunday. Or you ought to keep Christmas or something like that. And, and Haley's handbook is the same way. You, go, you look it up. It'll do exactly the same way. By their very teachings, the last thing that's in their heart is God's will. Traditions trump God's Word every time in their minds. As it says in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. These people draw near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Teaching the doctrines, the commandments of men. We do... Why don't people see that? Why don't people, you know, here we go, right back to what I'm saying. How many people have you spoken to saying, God won't mind if we disregard His commandment? God doesn't care. His laws are done away. Well, He never said that. I do what I do because of my children. I don't want my children to suffer. You know, I, these are hearts of stone, folks. These are hearts of stone, unyielding and undiscerning by their own choosing. Now, let's go into the next condition, the stony ground. You would think this is much the same thing. It, but it provides enough soil to where many seeds are able to germinate and begin to grow. If you've ever lived out in Gatesville, out west of temple area where temple's nice black dirt and good and thick and all this and everything out there, you might get three or four inches or two inches of soil out there. And that's about it. And on, on below it's either caliche or it's either gr gravel. 
or just solid rock in many occasions. And that's all you get to grow anything in, unless you build a raised bed. There's no deadness of the earth. There's no deadness in their heart. The plants do not take root, and they soon wither in the sun, and they die. The explanation Christ gave about this is in Mark chapter 4, verse 16. He says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time, and afterwards... When tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. So the hardness is just belief, uh, occurs just beneath the surface of the dirt or beneath the, the, the flesh. These people, they know much of the truth. They, they hear the truth. They understand the truth. They've heard it many times. They, they may have listened. I remember... <laughs> We took my dad to the feast one year up in Branson, and Garner Ted come walking down the side aisle before services started, and my dad wasn't, he didn't, I don't know, he was one of those that was kind of hard-hearted about things, I thought. But anyway, Garner Ted came down, and I introduced him, and, and my dad immediately said, oh, yeah, I remember you. I used to listen to you all the time up in uh, Wyoming on the back roads when I was driving at night. And I never knew that. I just looked at it. I said, are you kidding me? But he heard much of the truth. And uh, Garner Ted turned around and told him, said, yeah, you weren't listening to my dad. You were listening to me. Because my, my father thought he was listening to Garner Ted's father. But they, they've heard it. They consider the truth. They, they, they wallow it over in their minds or however you want to put it. But again, they reject God's word at one time or another because of persecutions, because of something, they're, because of family problems. A lot of times it's marital issues or whatever. They'll give it up. But it dies in their hearts, and they soon go back into the world. These people, it talks about in Hebrews, are blown about by the winds of doctrine. In, he, uh, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, it says, As a result... We are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men or by the craftiness and deceitful scheming. And this is the very thing that causes people to leave the truth. And, and a lot of times, oh, I'm not even going to go there. I'll leave that alone. But it's shallow soil. Now, plenty can grow there, but it never gets enough roots to take hold and produce fruit. They can be easily pulled away, easily dislodged from their, from their beliefs. Or the ground is so shallow the birds or the animals can, can easily dig up the seeds out and, and, and feast on them before they can even germinate. And animals will do that. Birds will. Crows, they'll get out, pick a garden clean if, if you plant it. It's kind of like telling somebody about the Sabbath and making a really great impression on this person. You got this. You think this person's bought it hook, line, and sinker. You know they they understand the Sabbath. They understand the holy days, and you're feeling really good about yourself. You know, and then they go talk to their preacher, <laughs> and their preacher comes back and, tell, and tells them, "said No, nah, that doesn't matter anymore. The law's done away with, and and we don't have those are old Jewish days and things like that. We don't do that anymore. Christians keep Sunday, the Lord's day, the days he, re he was resurrected. You see, that's a bird plucking away the seed. That's a bird snatching that seed from from that person, or snatching the words away from their their hearts and their mind. And and. It's just not good ground. It's not good for growing God's Word in. It, it wasn't cultivated well. It wasn't set up well for that person to take root, to have strong roots in God's words. Let's go on to the third one. Thorny ground. This is a little bit of a thorny issue, so we <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> it allows seed to grow. There's plenty of soil, everything else, and it'll grow good seeds. But then there's 
competing thorns and competing, and I like, I'm going to throw weeds in here too, and you'll see why in a minute. And they choke the life out of the beneficial plants that are growing, or the truth that's growing in this person. Christ explains it this way in Mark chapter 4, verse 18. He says, now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world and deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in and choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Yes, the truth of God, it'll take hold. It'll grow a plant. It'll grow a tree. It'll grow. It sees the light of day and it begins flourishing. And then the weeds come or the thorns come. And, and, and believe me, you can get them both. I'll take you back to my Gatesville analogy here. The briars out there can grow so thick you can't even see through them if you let them grow. And they can take over everything. They climb up trees all the way up 50 foot in trees and everything else. It's just unbelievable. And along with the weeds, if you don't tend to your garden, if you don't tend to them, you won't have a garden very soon. And oftentimes what we see... In, in these analogies, the words being the seed, well, the weeds are the doctrines of the world, which looks like the real thing, grow right beside the fruitful plants oftentimes, and the Bible calls them tares, but a weed grows faster and more prevalent just as the desires of the world take root in a man or a woman. It's a full-time job for someone tending a garden to keep the weeds out. If you don't stay in that garden hoeing those weeds and pulling those weeds and cleaning it out, you won't have a garden. The weeds and stuff will choke everything out. The weeds grow faster, they're more prevalent. They're just it's just it's just a job. It's a full time job for someone tending a garden to keep them out. Now, the weed is fighting for life, just like the doctrine of this world. It's fighting for life. It's trying to, to invade the hearts of everyone. That's its desire. That's what it wants to do. And it wants to grow in the hearts of everyone in this world. They want to spread their message to everyone in this world and have everyone believe as they do. So we have to tend our hearts to make sure we don't fall into the same category. Christ says thorny weeds come in the form of riches, fame, or the desire for these things, recognition, or worldly vices. But they can also take the form of doctrines, ideals, and personal beliefs. Don't deceive yourself. The weeds can be kept at bay, though, if we tend, tend to them the way we're supposed to, if we use prayer, if we use many of the other tools that we have in Scripture to keep our hearts pure for God. In Romans, it speaks of these folks who know God and His words. Romans chapter 1, verse 28. I'm not going to read the whole thing like I did last week. <clears throat> Just a portion. Romans chapter 1, verse 28, and he says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they did not like to. It didn't say they couldn't. It said they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whispers, backbiters, haters of God. Boy, that'll be a stony ground, wouldn't you say? Haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So these people know God. It said, it said early, further up in the verses, it said they knew God, but rejected it, the Creator. 
And when we let people in our church who are in the condition of a tear, so to speak. But I know people like to use that to describe people they don't like in church and stuff. But there are some people like that. And they are recognized as tares. And they become tares if we're not careful. Because they've let the world infiltrate their hearts. He goes on to say, in verse, 30, in verse 36, And the crowds went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, and he's talking about parables here, Explain to us a parable of the weeds in the field. This is about the tares. I'm sorry. I did the same thing you did. I didn't put the chapter on here. <coughs> uh, it's about the tares. Yes. I think it's Mark 7, but I'm not sure. But he says, Explain to us a parable of the weeds in the field. And he answered, One who sows is the good seed is the son of man. So here it, it tends to say the one who is a sower in this parable is the son of man. And the field is the world, and, this, and the good seed is the son's kingdom, and the weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is at the end of the age, and reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will be at the end of his age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all that, co uh, that causes all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into a fiery furnace, and in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then righteousness will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father who has an ear, let him hear. Now this, this gives us insight into the other parable, who the sowers are and different things of that nature and what the seed is. But it's not a good picture for those who strive to deceive God's people or deceive the world. But there are, there are many, 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 many people out there who do not realize that they're deceiving the world or their little group. They think they're doing God's work. But they don't realize that they're not. Now, I could do an advertisement for the two God seed churches and so far of that right now to explain this, but... There's Satan's way and there's God's way. There is no in-between. There's Satan's way and there's God's way. That's it. There is nothing else. I know many people out there like to say, well, I belong to this organization, I belong to that, or I'm a first this or a second that or, a, or a whatever. But there's Satan's way and there's God's way. It's just that. Simple. You're either a weed in the field or you're fruit. Mark chapter 4, verse 20. He said, Christ explains, he says, These are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it, bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. The seed, as we've seen, are the words from the Messiah. They are the words from the Bible, the Talmud, the Septuagint, any, you name it. It comes from, many, from several sources. As we've seen, it has an effect in different ways according to the people's willingness to accept it. I... I I can't reiterate that enough. According to the people's willingness to accept it. I truly believe in my heart if somebody really, truly believes to see God's truth, He will open their eyes long enough so that they can see it. Now what they do with it when He opens it up to them, well... They have basically four conditions in which they may, may fall under, according to Christ. Do we have a hand in that? 
yeah, I think we do. I think we can help in ways. I think there are ways to present it that it's more acceptable. I think there's ways to, to show people what the truth is. It's just, it's, it's, it's something that we've talked about on many levels and, and talked about many times after services and things, how we can get it out there, how we can talk about it, and how we can present it to people. But it, it, I think it, it is part, if, if we're going to be one of the sowers, we also got to be one of the people responsible for tending the field, helping it grow. Now, I know Christ supplies water, the spiritual water, the spiritual food, the spiritual fertilizer, whatever you want to say. But we got to be there too. Now, if we're not there, Satan has more of an opportunity to pluck the message away, pluck the words away before it can even grow. Therefore, preventing the heart or the word of God from making an impression upon that person. Now, Satan is represented by the birds depicted by the, the, uh, this parable. And Satan's words, as we saw in these, these two parables, are planted next to God's words. And we have to make a choice. And we've got to help people see that there, there are those two choices and it's hard many times on your own to make the right choice. Because there's so... Satan's got multitudes of sowers out there. Satan's got the industry locked down, so to speak. And he's, he's got his people working hard in the fields. And if we're not prepared to get in and work just as hard in God's fields, then we're not going to make much of an impression. Folks have to recognize what is God's and what is Satan's and discard Satan's words. The hard ground is where the seed never has a chance to take root. The stony ground pictures a man who professes delight with the word. However, his heart does not change when trouble arises. So his so-called faith quickly disappears. The thorny ground depicts one who seems to receive the word, but whose heart is, fully, uh, is full of worldly vices like riches and, and pleasures and lust and things of that nature. Or just worldly doctrine. The things of this world take that person's time and attention away from the Word of God. And he, and he or she ends up having no time for God in the end. The good ground portrays one who hears and understands and receives the Word, then allows the Word to accomplish righteousness in their life. The man represented, or his heart represented by the good ground is the only one of the four who bears fruit. And it says he bears fruit, some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100. And I know the question in your mind is here right now. I know it's on Billy's mind because I can feel it. <laughs> I'm just teasing. The question becomes, why does it say so much fruit is produced, yet we don't see it in reality? We don't see people walking in our churches every Sabbath that are new. Some people do. We had some new people last week, occasionally. So to answer that question, let's go back and, and look at the picture that Christ paints with his own parable. And let's remember why he uses a parable to teach people because parables are, as he said in verse 10 of... Well, I didn't put that chapter down either. I don't know why I didn't put chapter down. But it says, I'll just quote it here. He says, but when he was alone, those around him, 12, asked him about the parable. And he said to them, to you has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those that are outside all things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not 
understand, at least they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. So if he's speaking to them in this way, did he even intend for the seed to land on them? I don't know. You know, God's people know the mystery of his kingdom, at least enough to discern what he's saying in these parables. In a parable, in this parable, the farmer is sowing the seed, sowing the word. Well, how long does it take a seed to grow once you plant it? Stop and consider that. It takes a while, sometimes months. It, isn't, it depends on what is planted. It's not like we can go out and we can cast a seed out one day and the next day walk out and it's, you know, this high. Not unless you go to Walmart and buy a full plant. <clears throat> but that doesn't happen. It takes time to grow. It takes time to germinate. It takes time to take root and grow. If a person's hearing God's Word for the first time, either through the Internet or through our services or through our books or whatever, he, he's going to face challenges just like a new seed in the ground will face challenges. It, you know, the birds coming to pluck it away and different things like that, animals digging it up, and, and it goes back to the form of the Word of God coming into a person's heart. He faced challenges. He faced challenges from his family. Lack of spiritual water to keep it growing. Deceptions that he has to endure and, and to overcome. It, t it takes years sometimes for some people to see the basic truths of God and to, and, and to start coming to His services and, 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 and holy days and things of that nature. Even the most fertile ground can become difficult for a sower to grow seeds in. Even the most receptible person coming in and hearing God's Word, it can take time. It can take time. And that's the only answer I can give you for that. We don't always see, the sower doesn't always see the final, final product. He may go on to other fields or other jobs or whatever. So he doesn't see the final fruit that's coming up. So you don't know what your words did. I don't know what my words or what Joe's words or Randy's words or Barry's words have had an effect on people out there listening on the internet. I get emails occasionally and it just dumbfounds me. People have been listen, listening to, to our services for years. I remember I got one from Canada that was a small group that listened to our, our services every Sabbath in Canada. And I didn't know it until they sent me a, an email one time. And, and it goes out through all the world. So we don't know. We're casting, we're sowing the seed. We're casting the seed. God is casting the seed. Whoever you want to give credit to, I don't care. It's His words. So we don't know what kind of effect we have, have on people. You give out a book to somebody. We don't see where that book goes. We don't see who sits there and reads it and learns something from it. I know somebody gave a book to a guy up here. I didn't even know when we first put the books out. Guy calls me up. Told me, says, he'd been reading it. And I go, okay. Great, who are you? <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, we just, we just don't see. We can't see the seed sprouting in the ground. We can't see it until it pops up a little bit above the ground and starts growing and we start seeing it and then we can start helping water and tend to it. Others who are less fertile, I should say, for God's Word to take hold, they need tending and nurturing, like I said. And hopefully one day that they will also produce in the future for God. Some, some of hearts are capable for producing a lot of fruit. Some people are. Some aren't. 
But if you're in God's church, He says you are expected to produce. If you'll go to the parable of the talents, I wrote it down this time, Matthew 25. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Whatever you got, Randy, you're contagious. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew 25 starting verse 14 he says for and this is a parable of the talents he says for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling in a far country called his own servants and delivered his goods to them and to one he gave five talents to another he gave two and to another one and to each one according to his own ability and immediately he went on a journey then he who received the five talents went out and traded with them and made another five talents and likewise he who had received Two gain two more also. But he who had received one went out and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord and those of the servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five talents beside them. And the Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things, and I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, and he goes on the same thing. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. I will make you ruler over many things. Then verse 24, then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you'd be a hard man reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground and looked. There you have what is yours. But the Lord answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. If he didn't sow it, who did? Well, I'm looking at you. Yeah, he sowed some, some seeds. According to his parables, other seeds get sown without him. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers, and at my coming I would have received back to my own with interest. And take the talent from him, give it to him who has ten talents. For everyone who has more will be given, and he will have abundance. For from him who does not have, even what he has will be broken what, uh, or uh, taken away. And cast an unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> Every time I read that gnashing of teeth, I remember... Garner Ted said, someone asked him, said, well, why do they don't have teeth? <laughs> he said, teeth will be supplied. <laughs> but the, the point is, God expects a return on his investment. And he's invested in every one of his people. He spent time on you. He planted seeds with you. He, he cultivated you. And he expects an investment back in all of us. He expects results. And according to this parable, he's not wishy-washy about it. It says in Revelations that those who are lukewarm will be spewed out of his mouth. He doesn't like fence sitters. He, he likes workers. He likes sowers. He likes people who take his word and spread it to the world. And only a willing, loving, fertile heart can produce for God. Those are his words, not mine. And like I said in Revelation 3, everything else will be spewed from his mouth. So, I'll leave you with this question. What condition is your heart in? Thank you, Ron. All right. If everyone would uh, turn to page number 71 and stand, we're going to sing, Lord, I will praise thee. After which we're going to get Ron to come back up here for the Inquisition. I mean Bible study.
you now for Ron Harmon. Okay, softballs. <laughs> Anybody got any thoughts, any words, any sermonettes, anything? Like what is it, Billy? Yes, sis. No, but it, well, it actually kind of goes to Randy. Like, yeah. Back to what Randy was saying earlier. It's real good. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, it, it, it's uh, that t all the stuff on TV about the uh, has really bothered me lately. It's like y'all are speaking to me today because I was like letting it take over my mind. You know, it's driving me crazy to the point I can't even watch the news. You know, it's bothered me that bad. I was like, well, I, I think I needed this today. <laughs> mm, well, good. Mm. I, I remember many times we used to drive home when we first, after we first started going to church, we'd be driving home, or Danny and I, and we'd look at each other and go, is he talking about us? <laughs> <laughs> it just seems like sometimes those words hit the right spot. Yeah, they do. And so sometimes things need to be put in perspective all over again. It's yeah. like, okay, wow, yeah, that's yeah. how it starts. Yeah. And we wait for the, we try to get to the finish line so fast, and sometimes it's good to look back. It really is. Yeah. They compare that to last week's daily bread. <laughs> what? Last week the message was about our daily bread. Right. Oh. <laughs> Tie that in with this. What? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, being that uh, you say spread, you know, sow the seed all over the place. You know, I mean, you can land, like you know, uh, <clears throat> Billy and I came from a from a Catholic religion, mm -hmm. you know, and look where we at now. You know, I mean, the seed was planted there. And, and through our discernment and, uh, and, and our, uh, we didn't want to have covenant in that religion anymore. You know? So we have to break open the Bible and, 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 and oh. find the truth. Sure. And, and also, I mean, uh, these seeds can be over there, uh, uh, evil, uh, lo locale, like, you know, witchery and all this stuff. You know, seed can land in there too, and people come out of that. Mm -hmm. And, and also even, you know, uh, other churches too. Yeah. You know, well, it's, it's a thing, you know, it, it's like I said, we, especially since we broadcast this, we don't, it's the internet goes around the world. Anybody, we got people listen to us in India, we got people listen to us in Kenya, we got people listen to us in, in just several different places. It, it, hello, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like I said, it, it, it's surprising that people that were that Canadian group had been listening to us for years. They've, every Sabbath, you know, they, as a group of people, they listened to us. And we didn't know it, you know. We were just, we were just getting up like I do every Sabbath and speaking. Had no idea. We have no idea what effect we are having on people. We see this little group here, and we go, wow, you know, we get a little depressed sometimes. But because, you know, we want to see growth. Everybody wants to see growth. I mean, to be honest about it, we like to see new people. We like to, we like to be able to talk to them, see where they're from, you know, and get to know them and kind of things like that. But that's not the extent of who we are. The extent of who we are is worldwide because... Like I said, we're we're reaching people we don't even know, and and they can come and they can visit our site and hear our other sermons and things like that, and and they get to know who we, who we are. But the, a, a lot of it is too, is we have to sometimes in our local area, especially in our own little domain, we have to let people know that we that we are here as well, because unless you just accidentally come across us on the internet or something, you know. It, you're probably not going to go, so, you know, one day wake up and go, I don't know, who is this worldwide, I mean, uh, World Tomorrow Church of God or Tomorrow Church of God? And, uh, you know, I got I need to go to the Internet and look them up because we're not broadcasting on the TV as far as, as commercials or anything like that. So 
They either hear from us from a little card or a booklet or something, you know, a calendar, a pen left in a restaurant, which ought to be about two million in Georgetown. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine actually airing that on TV? And you'll find out what God said after these commercials. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm, just, I, I'm just saying, you know, we're spreading seed sometimes and we don't even realize. It. And if you've ever spread seed that way, Good. which I've done it, it's, it's, it's kind of neat because you don't really see where it all goes. If you put it in a planter and stuff, you know it all goes in a neat little row, so many, so, so far. Each, each little turn of the cog wheel or whatever. But if you're just casting seed out there, a lot of times you don't know where it goes. A lot of times it'll stay. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was gonna say a lot of times it'll stay dormant too until it's yeah. disturbed by something else. Well, that happened to us last year. We planted a bunch of onions over here. We thought they all died. <laughs> here about two months ago, they started sprouting and coming up again. You know, <laughs> I mean, they stayed dormant that whole time. They need an event outside mm -hmm. that might affect them when they move to another state or whatever. Say, you know what? I'm a member of this church. Yeah. yeah. You know, one other scary thing is just this uh, 50, 501 um, C3. C3 is, um, you know, it's like a, a kind of thing is something kind of you're tied in with the state, you know, and uh, it's kind of sound kind of evil to me, you know. I'm glad that you don't. Uh, as far as I know, you're not on it. We're okay. Uh, just that a lot of these people are, are uh, you know, when you go to this church, automatically they want your name. And uh, the only thing that really, if I can break in here, okay, the sure. only thing really a 50C3 helps you with as a church is if you want to accept, like. Uh, you want to uh, set up like a GoFundMe page or, or some kind of thing like that. You have to have a 501c3 to be a legal charitable uh, uh, organization. Of where, yeah, where you can, but you you can you can have a non a church non tax exemption file for that without being a 501c3 in Texas, and that's what we did. So there's no other than that. There's no other point in having one. Yeah. I mean, there's some, uh, if you're in it, you know, there's some bylaws, you know, uh, why you can't talk against or else they come after the church. Or if, they, or if the war breaks out, they can take over your building, you know, stuff like that. There's some bylaws into it, which uh, I'm, I'm kind of glad that we're not in it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we ain't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's wrap it up. I'm hungry. All right, final little song today. If everyone would turn to page number 30 and stand up, we're going to sing Go Ye Therefore Into All the World and Plant Your Seeds. After which, Billy Stephick to come do our closing prayer. We're into all the world. Preach the gospel unto everyone. Teach all nations to observe all things I have commanded you.
thank you. And now for our closing prayer, Mr. Billy Stepping. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you as God's people. We thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. Thank you for the bountiful rain so that our seeds may grow now, that we've planted them in the ground. Thank you for the food that you provided today to nourish our physical bodies. Thank you for this message. Please continue to guide and direct all of us and those watching on the internet as we go through this week. We ask all of this in Jesus' name, so let your will be done.